welcome back to another episode. And tonight we're going to be discussing Derrida, and in particular, the account he gives of the Pharmacon passage in Plato's Phaedrus. Now, I want to start this episode by connecting the theme of tonight's discussion with what I was saying about Wittgenstein in the prior episode. I was discussing the difference between speech and writing. And I was saying that for Wittgenstein, when it comes to speech, there is the potential for verifying, for verifying whether one has understood someone else correctly, and that that's a theme that comes up over and over again in the philosophical investigations. You can learn, you can be assured that you have learned math by doing something, performing some sort of action that lets the person who's writing a math problem on the blackboard know that you have understood the ideas in their mind, what they're trying to communicate in terms of those ideas to another person. And you might recall I was saying that Wittgenstein has this anti-psychologistic bent. He doesn't want to get into peering into people's minds. It's kind of a quasi-behaviorist approach to linguistics. And what that necessitates is trying to understand communication in terms of behavior, in terms of people doing things, acting in certain ways that show that they know or have understood what was meant or what was intended. It is by understanding the moves of all the pieces in a chess game that a person can show that he knows how the game is played. And in a similar way, we can show by using words in a sentence correctly that we know how the game of communication is being played. But in playing that game and in playing it with someone else effectively in a way that makes sense, as it were, shows that there is an effective communication of meaning and intention that is part of the playing in the game itself. I'll give one example. So in the early pages of the philosophical investigations, there's that passage where somebody says slab, and then if the worker knows what he's supposed to do, he goes and picks up a slab and puts it on something else. And that shows that something that was meant or intended was understood correctly. Now the case is otherwise when we get to writing, and this is something that has occupied literary criticism throughout the 20th century. And by Derrida's time, it came to a point of crisis because it almost seemed to people like in coming out of the 1960s into this age of relativism um, to try to suggest that there's no stable meaning in a text it seemed like we were opening the door to some sort of uh, pernicious relativism, the end of metaphysics, opening the door to anxiety opening the door to anxiety associated with indecidability. It seems like you could say that the Vietnam War and our cultural experience with the Vietnam War had a lot to do with dealing with undecidability. At a certain point, people were caught between two different motivations, uh, two different ways of acting, if you want, that showed that they had to decide for themselves and sometimes against beliefs that they had 
previously held and it put them in a space of anxiety. So there's, there's sometimes a, a need to find clarity. There's sometimes a need to move out of that state of indecidability, even if it is an uncomfortable way of getting there. But what I want to say is just simply that around this time, Derrida is discussing this very same kind of problem as arising out of writing, and he is trying to undermine the foundations of Western metaphysics. And we'll see a little bit tonight what his strategy is for doing that. And we are going to begin with a reading of a myth that is found in the Phaedrus involving two characters. One, the Egyptian god Thoth, who, uh, whose name is pronounced Thuth uh, in Plato's text, and Tammuz, another one who is the king, who is considered to be the king of kings uh, and the god of gods as well. That is the place that the Egyptian king occupies in that hierarchy. And so in a sense, the person he's talking to is his son, and Thuth slash Thoth is going to be bringing a gift to the king, the gift of writing, and the king will have to decide whether to accept it or not. So with that intro, here is the myth. I heard then that at Nocritus in Egypt there lived one of the old gods of that country, the one whose sacred bird is called the Ibis, and the name of the divinity was Thuth. It was he who first invented numbers and calculation, geometry and astronomy, not to speak of draughts and dice, and above all writing, grammata. Now the king of all Egypt at the time was Tammuz, who lived in the great city of the upper region which the Greeks called the Egyptian Thebes. The god himself they call Amon. Tooth came to him and exhibited his arts and declared that they ought to be imparted to the other Egyptians. And Thammuz questioned him about the usefulness of each one. And as Thuth enumerated, the king blamed or praised what he thought were the good or bad points in the explanation. Now Thamus is said to have had a good deal to remark on both sides of the question about every single art. But when it came to writing, Thuth said, quote, This discipline, my king, will make the Egyptians wiser and will improve their memories. My invention is a recipe, pharmacot, for both memory and wisdom, end quote. Okay, so just notice at the end there, there's the word pharmacon, and he, he being the god Thuth, in presenting the gift of writing to the king, is saying that it is a pharmacon, which can be understood either as poison or as a cure. And the punchline is that the king's verdict is that it is a poison rather than a cure. Now, a couple of points can be brought out to animate what's going on in the dialogue a little bit. And one is that the king has his creation, in a sense, is logos. Um, and logos is translated either as word, speech, sometimes argument, and sometimes uh, even God. And so that's, that's the gift of the king, or of the god of gods. And that's the logos. And what Thuth, his son, in a sense, is bringing to him is a kind of adumbration of the word, an adumbration of speech. And what the king says when Thoth brings him the word and asks him if he wants to accept it, is the king says, well, 
you've called it a pharmacon, and it is a poison. That's his verdict. And with this myth, Derrida is able to establish the extent to which speech has been linked to the ideas that are in a person's mind. They're linked to the ideas in a person's mind more intimately than writing is. And there is a sense, perhaps, in which Plato and Wittgenstein are actually on the same page in this regard. So there's a way in which, in speech, speech can, as, as it is spoken, speech can um, act to defend itself in someone's uh, in someone's laying down a certain set of words in an argument, whatever. If somebody has misunderstood what they were saying, they can correct them. There's a kind of living presence of the idea that is in speech that is absent from writing. Because writing is not animated in this sense. Writing cannot defend itself from people misunderstanding it. But that can be done in a speech situation. So Plato does this in the text, and Derrida points out that this is one of the core foundational ideas in Western metaphysics, that is to privilege speech over writing. And when we get to Aristotle in the De Interpretatione, he says, as I mentioned last time, that first there are the ideas in the person's mind, then there are, then there are words, speech, logoi, that reflect those ideas, and then another remove from speech is writing. So there's the idea, there's the speech, and there's the written word. And to try to get from writing back to the idea requires something more than just having a conversation with somebody. So there's this way in which Western metaphysics, as part of its getting off the ground, has privileged speech over writing. And speech contains the truth. It's closer to the idea, the truth of what was meant, the truth of what was intended. So it, you might notice here that this idea is also pretty close to what we find in the Hebrew tradition, where when God speaks the world comes into being, or the universe comes into being. And in the Christian tradition, when you get to the Gospel of St. John, you notice in the first couple of lines, he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Okay, and we have a similar kind of scenario where the king's offspring, in a sense, is the word, is the speech. And in the Christian tradition, we have God and then his son, who's the offspring. Okay, so an important point to make about this is simply that when it comes to Western philosophy, the origin of truth is in the Logos itself. And this has had a very long history that Derrida tries to relate to the development of scientific thinking. There's a, a way in which the tradition of Western science has tried to set itself up in a logocentric manner, a manner in which there has been a subversion of the role of writing as something a third remove from speech and the way in which logoi in science uh, works with episteme, which is knowledge, is that logoi try to present themselves as if they were 
as if they had a certain access to a higher truth. This also happens in the case of writers like Husserl and Descartes, where in the case of Husserl, there's an attempt to find what he calls a transcendental signifier, which is this unitary point of pure consciousness, pure ideality, pure meaning that isn't mediated by something else. And for Husserl, it's by reducing all of these elements of consciousness, bracketing them out, that we're able to get to this transcendental signified. And that signified, if it can be pointed to, if it can be gestured to by any sort of logos, is something that even transcends the language itself. And the same thing happens in the case of Descartes, where eventually he tries to uh, get beyond language, to try to get beyond ideas, uh, tries to get beyond images to pure ideas. So in the case of the Chiliagon, which is a 1,000-sided shape, the only way that we're able to think about it is by getting beyond images and getting into the pure ideas of things. So the thing to notice about this, and it will help to just understand what Derrida's overall strategy is in his writing, is first of all, just to notice the way in which logos and speech are correlated. If you understand that, then you can pick up a lot of Derrida's writing and have a much better access to it. So Logos is word, speech, argument, and then Logos is always tied to speech rather than to writing. So that's a very important point. And Derrida's strategy in doing this historical kind of, you know, unearthing of the origins of this kind of thinking. Uh, his strategy is kind of a historical, kind of a genealogical one. It might remind you a little bit of Foucault doing an archaeology of knowledge, looking at different strata, different layers of knowledge as they've been sedimented on top of one another over time. And what Derrida is doing is he's taking us back to this inaugural moment in Western metaphysics. He's showing us where something creeped in culturally to our basic understanding of the world that is maybe so much in our subconscious mind so much there in the background that we don't even take notice of it when it appears before us. Um, he points out that throughout the history of Western philosophy, people have reiterated this point about the link between speech and truth or speech and its proximity to the idea Figures like Rousseau, St. Augustine, etc., and Husserl, as I mentioned, are all included in that group. And there have only been a couple people throughout history who have really questioned that link. One is uh, Nietzsche. And what Derrida is going to try to do is he's going to try to undermine the privileged position that has been given to one member of a binary pair over the other. So what he does strategically in his texts is he'll say, well, I've discovered that in the history of Western philosophy, we privilege speech over writing. And so speech has a kind of uh, centrality, its proximity to truth and ideality, pure ideality. <laughs> 
it has a closer proximity than writing. And so what Derrida will do is he will try to flip the two. He'll try to see if what is supplemented, what is brought in as a supplement, can stand in for the privileged position that has been given over to speech. So he'll try to subvert that pair. So that's one of his strategies. And another one that should be mentioned is the idea of a trace. And what the trace is, is um, maybe it can be thought of in terms of an example of a playing card. So we have on one side of the card the signifier, like let's say dog. And on the other side of the playing card we have the image of the dog. So that's the signified. And when people like Saussure think about the relationship between the signifier and the signified, it's as if one is simply the other side. One is simply, they're, they're two sides of the same card, is what I'm trying to say. And there's a sense in which when we are trying to pick apart the unity of the sign, uh, there is a sense in which that unity um, is, is something that actually has difference at the very heart of it. And a way to think about difference is if you have some scissors and you start cutting shapes, it's not until you start cutting them out that you notice the differences between the shapes themselves. And so in the same way, it's only when we have words and we have meaning that we at the same time begin to have difference. So just as shapes are articulated in a certain sense by their very opposition to the other shapes in the act of cutting them out, so do we, by the very fact that we are doing that cutting, begin to have some sense of signification. So these are some very interesting, very useful ways of thinking about the relationship between signifier, sign, and difference. And where the trace comes in is that between the relationship of the signifier and signified, there is always a memory of that difference. There's always some kind of sense of that difference that never quite is lost to us. Um, and that's the trace that appears in language. And the trace is a trace of the way in which the sign differs from the other signs. It is the way in which other signs differ from it that is never lost. So those are some important words to have in your vocabulary or to understand when you're reading Derrida. And for our purposes, just seeing that we have these binary oppositions that have been handed down to us as part of the tradition of Western metaphysics between the self and the other, between the one and the many, etc. That has always been the project of Western philosophy to try to ground, try to, um, to give stability to, and what Plato is doing in his theory of forms, which is where the bigger significance of this whole discussion actually lies. In Plato's theory of forms, we have the setting up of sets of binary oppositions and oppositions of all sorts, really, in their most pristine pure and stable form. And when the philosopher can develop a logos, 
that is an argument, a speech, that can direct people to those pristine, pure ideas, ideas of justice, truth, beauty, piety, etc. We can find a way past things that are either false or misleading. And it is, of course, writing that has the potential to mislead, just like he tries to argue that art and poetry have the potential to mislead people. And you kind of get the impression that maybe in Plato's way of thinking, there are three basic tiers to the way that he conceives the whole world being structured, with the bottom tier being um, our world of the senses, and the middle term, just this fog of words, of which some may be true, others may be false, and some may simply be indecidable. And then above and beyond that, there's this heaven that we're trying to reach, the heaven of decidability, the heaven of clarity. And the role of the philosopher is to lead people beyond the fog to that heaven of clarity and decidability. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the discussion, what Derrida does is he tries to actually try to lead us back to that very point of indecidability. And you could say that the reason that he does so is to show us the origin of this inaugural move in Western culture so that we can begin to see it as what it is, not as something that should simply be taken for granted or as a dogma that we don't even realize that we hold, but as something that we can unearth and begin to under, use to understand Western culture and its way of privileging certain forms of binary oppositions. I just want to make one other point, though, which is that in the um, Republic, it is the guardians who are set up they're educated in such a way that they're able to act as physicians to the state, which um, goes kind of hand in hand with this discussion of the pharmacon as being either a poison or a cure. Writing is either a poison or a cure, and the guardians of the state will be able to heal it, set it back to its health, to a healthy state, through their means of being able to utilize logoi so as to lead us away from poison and toward something that will cure the state, cure society of its waywardness. So with that, we will call it a